Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Ledbury. I'm the director of the Power Institute at the University of Sydney. And I'd first like to um, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Gadigal land. I'd like to pay my respects to Gadigal elders past, present and emerging. And as of course, we share knowledge and learning here at the university. We respect and, uh, the knowledge embedded forever in Aboriginal custodianship of country. And I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, first kicking off our power events for the whole year, but to be thanking and welcoming Professor Mackenzie Walk uh, virtually in, uh, back to Sydney, sadly only virtually this time. Uh, thanks to her and thanks to you all for being here across, uh, as we know, a range of time zones and uh, to, uh, sneaking off for your lunchtime fix, so to speak. Um, just a reminder that the Power Institute here at the University of Sydney exists to generate and diffuse ideas about art and visual culture through events and programs and through publications. And as this is the first of the um, uh, events of, of the whole year, I just want to uh, remind you or uh, uh, let you know that we have three series this year um, running um, in, with a mixture of live and, uh, uh, and uh, Zoom-based events. Uh, three series, One, this one, Image Complex, about which uh, Nick Krog and the convener will speak in a moment. Uh, uh, Ways of Being, which is convened by my colleague Stephen Gilchrist, the uh, Deputy Director of Power, and the Sydney Asian Art Series convened by Olivier Fischer. Each, uh, as I say, convened and uh, uh, shaped by, the, by expert conveners. They all have a, 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 a specific research focus. They're all free, but registration is essential. And uh, we'll put a link in the chat to where you can find out more about all these events and sign up uh, and register. But thank you all for being here. And I'm delighted now to hand over to my uh, power colleague, our events and program uh, coordinator, Nick Crogan, who is also the convener of this Image Complex series. Thank you so much again, Mackenzie, and thank you, Nick, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Nini Nalawangun Mari Bujiri Gari Nurida. These words in the Sydney language mean we meet together on the very beautiful Gadi country. Uh, I'm a person of white settler heritage and I say these words in language to pay my respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation whose unceded land uh, is the place I am meeting you from today. Uh, as Mark just mentioned, um, today's lecture is the first in a series of public talks that the Power Institute is hosting uh, this year entitled Image Complex. The term image complex was coined uh, by US activists and scholars Yates McKee and Meg McGlagan to describe the infrastructure that has arisen in recent decades to produce and circulate the image world that now forms such a dominant part of our lives. The image complex is not just one place or thing, but rather an always shifting network of people, institutions, technologies, and platforms. At stake in the image complex, uh, then uh, is not just the content of what we see, but rather what is seeable and what it means to see at all in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Image Complex points to a much longer history of vision, understood not as something universal, unchanging or natural, but rather as something that is the product of a distinct historical and political forces. The series this year presents lectures by four leading international scholars of the image complex, Mackenzie Wark, Zainab Chelek Alexander, Lisa Nakamura, and Tina Kant. These thinkers are, I believe, um, leading a really exciting new wave of thinking about visuality, one that builds on, but also breaks from um, earlier visual culture studies uh, in very important ways that we'll be exploring through the series. One of the key ways it does this is to center its work in perspectives long marginalized by studies of modern culture, queer and trans studies, radical black aesthetics, media theory, and the work of queer women of color. These thinkers and perspectives allow us to see our contemporary image complex, not as an immovable machine, but rather as a complex and unstable assemblage, vulnerable at all moments to rupture by alternative histories and possible futures. So today's speaker, Mackenzie Wark, has been inventing a language 
to talk about such ruptures for many years. She is the author of uh, over 20 books uh, and innumerable chapters, articles, artworks. Um, she's currently a professor of media and culture at the New School in New York City. Um, and rather than me um, listing um, her many accomplishments, um, we're going to begin today with a short interview um, to briefly outline um, her intellectual trajectory to date. Um, and then Mackenzie will present uh, her lecture, which will last about 35 minutes or so, um, after which there'll be time for a QA. and um, And we invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A function, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can also upvote and comment on other people's questions. Um, so um, with that, um, welcome Mackenzie and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure. Uh, greetings from uh, Kanasi land. I'm sorry, I can't be back in uh, Sydney in person. Um, of course. And and um, could you tell us a bit more about where you're where you're coming from today? You're um, at, at home by the looks of it, um, but in the evening, first of all. Yeah, it's 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 nine p.m. and uh, in in what's now known as Bushwick in uh, the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Terrific. Thank you so much. And not a lot of people may know this, but um, you, in fact, grew up not too far from where I'm speaking from um, in Sydney. Um, you grew up in, in Newcastle and then moved to um, Sydney in the, in the 80s, um, which is where you sort of began your career as a writer. Um, could you tell us a little bit um, about what you were writing about then and, and who you were writing with? Oh God! I like, how to do that justice? Yeah, I moved to from I'm Novocastrian. Uh, shout out to Novocastrians out there. I moved to Sydney in 1980 to go to uh, Macquarie University originally to study law. Uh, a funny story. I and it connects to what I'm going to talk about is is I I wasn't all that keen on studying law. I I really loved uh, studying uh, criminology with Gil Baringer, who was a sort of radical criminologist. And that put me in contact with the so-called sociology of deviance and stuff like this. And I was reading this stuff going, this is about my friends and, and the policing of my friends. Like, I don't want anything to do with any of this. So my exit was then into uh, cultural studies and media studies. Um, and I, I graduated in something like that at Macquarie. And then I was at UTS, um, mm -hmm. did a master's degree there and fell into academia. Um, yeah, but I used to write about music. I was uh, on the staff of uh, On the Street, which later became Drum Media. Uh, I used to work in you know, freelance at ABC Radio quite a lot. Uh, so many little magazines, you know, I kind of that I worked on uh, over the years. So yeah, I kind of I always had one foot in in writing and another in uh, academia. I also went went back to Macquarie and taught there for for a decade. Oh, I, I my PhD was going to be at at uh, University of Sydney in Fine Arts, uh, but I didn't get the scholarship. So uh, 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 the U University of Sydney doesn't get to claim me. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> and um, I think at, the, at that time, you were sort of part of a kind of intellectual scene um, that um, you've called the sort of Sydney post-structuralist scene. Um, I don't know if you were the one to coin that term, but... Um, there was, you know, Sydney in particular was sort of a hub for a particular type of cult cultural studies. Yeah, I, I feel like it got a little bit uh, downplayed in the history of Australian cultural studies because it was maybe a little less academic and more connected to uh, avant-garde, to art practices, to social movements and things like that than some of the other uh, centres of it. Um, uh, the uh, lecture series that Power used to do, uh, the annual series, the Murray Kutner lecture was like incredibly influential for me. That was how I got in touch with the work of and met uh, Larry Grossberg, uh, Dick Hebdige, um, I'm going to blank on who the other names were. I think Megan Morris did that too. I think I already I was aware of Megan's work, but she was a central figure in that, that universe. Uh, who I got to publish in Intervention, I edited three issues of that with a group of others as a collective. Yeah, so I, I don't know, I, I kind of always have like one foot in uh, bohemias and avant-garde and social movements and another in, you know, sort of media and another in academia. And that's where I ended up, you know, sort of mm. finding my day job. And what was the sort of um, the, the power of doing cultural studies 
from Australia in particular, as opposed to the sort of traditional um, kind of academic centres of the US and Europe? Uh, less bound by uh, disciplinary constraints, uh, less bound by how kind of ridiculously class stratified, particularly American higher education is, uh, uh, closer potentially to kind of social movements. And, you know, our universe, uh, universities are in cities rather than the middle of nowhere, so you could be immersed in a kind of cultural world. Uh, so, and, and the, the real advantage for, for me was contact with people who worked on uh, or, or were doing uh, Aboriginal media and cultural work uh, in the 80s. It was the era of like Karma Radio. Um, there was uh, uh, like Stephen Mukey was very important to me, Eric Michaels. Uh, I, you know, I could name others, but people who were essentially doing some version of cultural studies in relation to Aboriginality. Uh, that, was, that was really mm. key. And um, in that period, in the sort of 90s, um, you published already a number of books um, and including sort of concepts that um, are still at work in, in your current research and writing. And, and one of those I wanted to mention in particular was the concept of the vector, um, because I know it's something that you, you have been using in recent work as well. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what you meant by that term and, and how, I guess, your thinking has changed about it over the years. Yeah, I got that from the late uh, Paul Virilio, who was sort of very influential for me. And it's a way of thinking that, that makes sense given Australia's like massive dependence on uh, transnational communication and things like that. Uh, how the, the telegraphy made, you know, a certain version of colonialism possible uh, and so on. So, I mean, it's a simple idea, like a vector is just a line of fixed length, but no fixed position. Uh, and so to think media as, as having that particular kind of combination of affordances where, you know, telegraphy has a certain uh, way that it makes information move faster than goods or armies. Uh, but at the same time, you're heavily dependent on having a track for it. You know, certain adventures in British colonialism in the Middle East are probably mostly about where the telegraph would go to try to control India and so on. And we're like an afterthought to that whole story. Uh, so, yeah, like, like Vector seemed to be a useful way to sort of start asking media questions in cultural studies at the same time as asking cultural studies questions in media studies and to sort of move between the two. Cultural studies mm -hmm. I found was so good on, on media specificity and for media studies you could get that sort of tension to form. Mm -hmm. And then in around sort of 2000 you then kind of relocated from Australia to, to New York um, and it was there that you authored some of the, the work that you're perhaps best known for, which is um, the book, uh, The Hacker Manifesto, um, which introduces another term that's been really important to your work since the hacker um, uh, and the formation of a hacker class. Um, would you be able to say a little bit about what that term meant for you then, a, a hacker? Yeah, I, I kind of had to reinvent myself. You know, I, I moved to, to New York for love. You know, I didn't do it for a career. Uh, and there's really not a lot you could do. I, I, you know, my last two books were on Australian cultural studies and no one cared. Like, I'm sorry, but that, that was just the reality of it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Australians are always surprised by this, but how much do we know about Belgium? You know, like the, the population of Australia is about the same as Belgium and we know nothing about it. So that's how the world, you know, like relates to, to us. You know, that's just the... Uh, so, yeah, I, I picked up this other strand that I was sort of um, involved with kind of um, digital avant-garde that were internet-based. It was a way from Australia to be connected to uh, sort of social movements and avant-garde elsewhere in the world. I was on a list server called nettime.org, which was very central. Uh, Australian Network for Art and Technology was like really uh, on the ball in terms of, you know, sort of investing in us being able to move around and make connections. And yeah, so I so then basically started thinking about how uh, digital media was was transforming uh, the whole kind of mode of production is, is what I was kind of observing. And maybe one of the things it was doing is creating a new kind of subordinate class. So not labor as sort of traditionally understood, but uh, that some version of exploitation was now being able to extract information out of all of us 
uh, and, and kind of capitalize on asymmetries of information or to sort of think of political economy from that point of view. And one of my recent books, Capital is Dead, sort of restates and re revises the theses of uh, Hacker Manifesto. So I, I, people started to plagiarize it, quite frankly. I was like, I should like write my own book about my own ideas because I'm seeing them, the other people doing it now. <laughs> I'm sort of in the footnotes, but not really acknowledged. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and that's the proposition of well, what if this isn't even capitalism anymore, it's something worse, then how would we theorize that with concepts that apply directly to it? And and the, I was going to ask the, the sort of recent book um, uh, about um, what comes after capitalism sort of pits together these two concepts that we've spoken about, the sort of an antagonism between a vectoralist class um, and a hacker class, um, and that that antagonism is um, kind of uh, productive of a new type of um, mode of production that's not necessarily capitalism, might be something uh, entirely different. Yeah, not, not capitalist at its top commanding layer, like most of the economy is capitalist. Underneath that is this landlord peasant economy that a huge chunk of the world is still in. So modes of production are always articulated to each other. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a well established in Marxist theory. But what if there's a new one? Like, that's a question I, I felt wasn't being asked. Uh, so, and, and that was you know, my thesis 20 years ago in Hacker Manifesto, and I've sort of restated it, and it's sort of getting a little more traction uh, mm -hmm. second time around, I think. Because I, I, there's, you know, whether one accepts the, the provocation that it's new mode of production, I think there's a widespread sense that there's some mutation in how commodification and exploitation works, and how do we understand that? Mm. And um, speaking of the sort of current situation bringing us up to the present, I, um, I know that a lot of your recent books have been um, about kind of mobilising a new syllabus of thinkers and writers to, to analyse our moment. So people from sort of Donna Haraway to Kodwo Eshon to um, Jackie Wang, who I understand is now a colleague of yours at, at, at New School. Um, was. <laughs> was. She went okay. to uh, USC. Okay, right. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, all these thinkers coming from very different fields. Um, and I, I was, wanted to ask what, what for you links all these thinkers and what makes them important to think about today? I, you know, I, I started out as a Marxist and, and so that's a method that's discipline independent or wanted to be. And, you know, I've sort of revised and rethought that a little bit, but uh, what's what's the politics of knowledge? Like what's a praxis of knowledge where you would be able to uh, use the concepts uh, that are applicable to a particular side of struggle or creation? Uh, and they might come from any discipline at all. You, you look at the way artists work, that's often how artists work in relation to any material at all. And it's how artists work in relation to ideas as well. So what if we thought a bit like that? And so I did two books in particular, uh, General Intellects and Sensoria, uh, which were based on my uh, lecture courses. Um, and it's sort of how to uh, really do interdisciplinarity, which I, I feel like go, does go back to Australian cultural studies, had a bit of that flavor. And, and mm. before that, Stuart Hall, you know, like Stuart Hall's project uh, at, um, uh, the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham. It's radically interdisciplinary, but it's applied to the project of figuring out class struggle and culture, essentially. Mm. And I, I wanted to ask as well about that and, and the, you know, how you see your role as a, an academic and a writer and a teacher today. Um, I know in the, the 90s, your writing was sort of, um, uh, you kind of presented... Um, yourself in, in the role of a public intellectual in a lot of ways. Um, and I wonder if you would still use that term to describe your work or if, if there's a sort of new um, formation that's more useful to think of, of the, the importance of academic work and researching and writing. I mean, I think public intellectual was connected to a particular uh, articulation of intellectual work to political economy that's probably passed. And so I, I was using the term general intellects in, in the book of that name, sort of mis slightly misusing a, a term from uh, a famous text by Marx, uh, to sort of think about uh, all of our intellectual labor is now, you know, essentially extractable uh, in ways that weren't possible even 20, 30 years ago. 
Uh, so maybe one would sort of rethink that. But in, in my own personal trajectory, yeah, I, I had a newspaper column in The Australian for like nine years, you know, like which I, I quit when I immigrated. Uh, and I don't have that now. And, you know, it was possible at the time <laughs> I appeared to be uh, a, a middle class, provincial, like, you know, white boy. Uh, there's nothing you can't do if that's, if that's what you appear to be. No, I'm like, no, like patriarchy is real. You know, I could just just like show up and write a column and be on the radio and and you know do all those things. I don't have those opportunities in the United States. Like I don't have the pedigrees, so I've had to like find a different way of working and, and a different corner and and one that's frankly better for my mental health than what I was doing in the '90s. You know, uh, it's 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 the 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 situation changed, but also I've I've had to adapt to being an immigrant. Uh, and and you know having a very peripheral place in in this uh, cultural landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, one large part of your your work that we haven't spoken about is of course your contribution to queer studies um, and more recently trans studies. Um, but I understand that's going to be the topic of your talk today. So I thought um, on that note I might um, pass across to you to um, to give your lecture. But thank you once again for being here. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nick. A pleasure. So I'm just launching into it at this point, yeah? Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, my thanks to everybody for uh, coming along. Um, so yeah, I, I call this Refuge in the Unseen, uh, in Queer and Trans Raves. Uh, and I, I kind of thought in relation to like image complex to talk about situations where one of the main objectives is to make the visual uh, a sense that you don't really get to use all that much. So to what extent is there possibilities for queer and trans existence in, in a kind of, uh, opacity is a word that belongs elsewhere maybe, but a, but a sort of uh, semi-visibility in, in the space of the unseen. So the things I want to talk about, you know, is the city, nightlife, uh, techno as a specific musical form. Uh, and then I'm, I'm thinking about parts of New York City and its analogues in, in other cities all over the world and not just the Western world, where what's a kind of uh, non-working life for those of us who do digital labour of one kind or another and how it, does that end up being connected to maybe a kind of digital unlabour where what, what I love about a good rave is, is, is the amount of work everybody is doing without producing a single commodity. You know, like everybody is working away uh, with their bodies and nothing is the product, which strikes me as not a bad way of dealing with capitalism or worse, whatever this is. So I'm interested specifically in a uh, little corner of queer and trans uh, nightlife where queer and trans people aren't necessarily even the majority, but we're a significant presence and where our presence is ordinary and usually fairly unremarked. There's still harassment. I had to smack some guy on the dance floor a couple of weeks ago. Um, but there are other, many, many other versions of queer and trans nightlife. And I just want to be explicit that there's some that I won't be addressing. Uh, this is not the world of um, what trans women will refer to as the dolls. All dolls are trans women. Not all trans women are dolls. I'm not one. The dolls would live at that intersection of uh, working in nightlife, sex work, high femme performance, attraction to men. Not quite my world. And, and there's a specific nightlife world of for dolls and by dolls that I'm not talking about. Nor am I talking about ballroom. I'm not talking about house music. Uh, this way in which house music has a very specific resonance for uh, Black Americans, particularly who came up through the church, because it, you can think of it as church in a way. Uh, world of Techno is a slightly different world to that. This is a slide of uh, Kevin Aviance, like legendary drag performer. I took this image at uh, the kitchen. It's a world that I'm not talking about. I'm going to talk about a sort of slightly different one in a slightly different corner. So. Um, what am I doing? What is the method here? Is it ethnography, journalism, documentary? It's a little bit of all of those. It's a little bit auto-fictional. Um, and here I'm talking about the book that I've uh, sort of wrapped on all of this. It's auto-fiction because there are a lot of things I don't want to directly say. I don't want to name people. I don't want to name parties. I don't want to name where these things happen. 
because like none of that needs be, to be public at all. Uh, and then auto theory, in what way is my experience of this something at which, at which I can draw concepts? So yes, that's my feet on a table at a party. <laughs> So I'm interested in you know, what's felt and what's embodied more than what's seen. These are situations that evade the uh, image complex. And I'll say a little bit more about this. Uh, so I'm drawing uh, on experiences and then looking for what I call resonant abstractions. So they're concepts that uh, come out of my experience of these spaces, but hopefully resonate with those of other people. I'm not trying to speak in the place of anybody else, but hopefully this experience will resonate with how some other people experience these uh, particular worlds. Uh, that's my little rave bag that I take to every party and my little, my wrap. Uh, and you can see my earplugs dangling from the right-hand side there. So shout out to uh, Nick Bizzano, uh DJ, uh, in his own right, and as half of Pure Imminence, who's doing a PhD on all of this and from whom I've learned a lot. Uh, shout out to January Hunt, uh, not my trans mom, but, but sort of a uh, great aunt to many, many uh, trans women, particularly in the rave scene in, in New York City. Uh, also magnificent DJ. Uh, shout out to, oops, missed one, uh, Cranberry Thunderfunk, uh, my friend Tim on the left, who was doing lights. This was my birthday. <laughs> uh, Tim, like wonderful uh, uh, connector and organic intellectual with this whole scene. Shout out to just Jasmine Infinity in the middle there, uh, from whom I've also learned a whole lot. I could keep adding names, but I want to acknowledge some people that uh, I've drawn from. Uh, and also Utkina on, on the right there. Uh, uh, yes, honey, <laughs> I'm going to name you too. But I'm interested in the point of view of the raver rather than the DJ. Uh, and because I think that's a quite specific set of experiences to sort of decenter. There's particularly like, you know, like boys talk about, you know, uh, playlists and DJs, and, and I don't want to do that. I want to talk about what it's like to actually be dancing. And I'm going to talk here for a minute about social types and position the raver in relation to four others. And these, uh, some of these terms have come through rave friends. You go to the party and co-workers are people who don't do this a lot and they're there to get have some like wild experience to tell their co-workers about on Monday morning afterwards and they often drink too much and they're not experienced party goers and you try to avoid them. Uh, punishers can be people even in the scene but who want to police it all the time. You know, there's things that need to be said and done uh, about bad behavior, but there's a kind of punitive side to that sometimes. That's another social type. Club kids are another social type who are really there to be seen, uh, which is fine. There's spaces for that, but a rave is not really the place to get your camera out. Circuit gays uh, for whom uh, the party is also a place to have sex. I'm not against sex at parties, might have done it. Um, but maybe that's not the main thing that I'm there for. The raver, in contrast to all of those, is someone who is there because they need that space and need to dance. So the, the need is kind of crucial to defining the sort of uh, social type and subjectivity that I'm interested in. Now, once you discover that need, I rediscovered it. I used to go to raves in the 90s, and I found out after I transitioned that um, transition dealt with my dysphoria pretty well, but some of it's very diffuse and uh, transition didn't solve it. And I went back to raves and it did, but then lockdown. So I was just kind of screwed as a lot of people were. Some people do not do well without the kind of distributed uh, subjectivity, erotic social world uh, of queer life. Uh, not everybody can retreat back to, you know, domestic private property family world during the lockdown. So we had to improvise and manage different kinds of risk. This is not my first pandemic. I lived through the HIV AIDS crisis. I lost friends in that. So I'm used to this idea of, of negotiating harm reduction and risk. So uh, rooftop parties, this is um, my dear friend, Jesse DJing uh, on her roof. Thank you, Jesse and Annika. Uh, that's Adonis uh, DJing on the right. I can tell because of that Telfar bag. Uh, I don't know who's dancing. I wouldn't name them anyway. So rooftops uh, during that period. But there's also a way that the lockdown was a great era for like street raves. They were like free or, or by donation. 
So it's sort of like a psychogeography of the city that you could discover all of these landscapes where people are looking for somewhere to put a generator and some speakers and, and some decks. Uh, this is a spot behind the, uh, the Ikea in Red Hook. Uh, that was a party spot for a while. Um, this is a really great uh, street rave slash uh, protest. That's the Statue of Liberty behind a mountain of gravel, I think. You, you find these weird, like, mixed-use, you know, landscapes. Yes, the, you can see, like, a basketball hoop. There's a dead-end street. If the police had kettled us, we would have had to swim out of it, but fortunately that didn't happen. Uh, you discover the junk space of the city. This is a side of Bushwick, uh, which has a lot of light industrial space, some of it a little underutilized. Uh, and this is sort of like a street party, uh, literally the wrong side of the tracks. There's railway tracks where, and, and an overpass is where I'm shooting that from. I love it that this party was called Regression because, you know, like the thing that Adorno was so mad about is exactly the thing you want to happen at a good party. There's, I can, there's some friends there I won't name, but if I can see. Uh, this one was wild. This party was in a, um, a rail siding yard on uh, Newtown Creek, which is between uh, Brooklyn and Queens. And it was all city, all these different scenes come together. It had this really kind of chaotic energy. I didn't stay long at that one. And the police shut it down shortly after I left. Uh, and some of this behavior is unsafe and I'm not uh, advocating that, but these things happen uh, and I was there to see it. So that was the lockdown era. Uh, nightlife came back um, when everybody started to get vaccinated. Uh, and Bushwick is a centre uh, for that within Brooklyn. There are plenty of clubs that specialise in techno as a musical form. Techno became a kind of uh, common currency for different kinds of scenes and experiences. The fact that there's nightlife centred in Bushwick is not unconnected to the gentrification of this part of uh, Brooklyn have to acknowledge that and the role that queer nightlife kind of plays as one of the moments of the cycle of gentrification. But I'm also interested in the way that uh, going to nightlife, being in clubs and in the rave in particular, uh, is kind of a release valve for those of us who do not only digital labor, but emotional labor, service work, including sex work and other people who work in nightlife. As someone who goes to raves usually early in the morning, you see all of the other workers from all of the clubs come to the, uh, you know, like you, you spent your <laughs> working night managing people uh, in a nightclub and then you have to go to another space to like dance it off. It's a sort of common experience. Uh, so the meeting of all of those kinds of labor in the space of unlabor interests me as well. Uh, to quote Janice, Rose, what makes illegal raves better is that they are illegal. There's something special about things that happen in, in the sort of the, the one-off warehouse space uh, that will go a lot later. The clubs all shut at four, but good rave will go through morning or later. There's, there's something special about that discovery of how a space has been repurposed. Uh, the good raves are no photo, uh, like, like you, what happens on the dance floor stays there to have phones out or be taking photographs interrupts the flow of movement and sound and bodies anyway. Uh, this is someone putting their fingers over my camera because I was too close to the dance floor and he was right. I shouldn't have been taking this picture. <laughs> so, and I, I've, I've forgotten his name, but you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I see him all the time now. Um, so there's something about being outside the visual complex that's interesting to me of, of sort of taking, dialing down, being able to see it all. Uh, I was at a party a couple of weekends ago and my glasses fogged up and I left them on fogged so I would like see even less. And it's going, kind of like, oh, I'm really feeling the music differently this way. Uh, so to create a space, it's a space that's still technological, right? You need the light and the DJs and, and the decks and huge sub bass and all that. So it's not outside the technical, but it's outside the visual. So you, can you reposition yourself in a technical landscape uh, to, to sort of decenter the power of the gaze? That strikes me as kind of an interesting kind of affordance of uh, this particular situation or, or vector, if you want to call it that. So uh, I want to document this. I don't want to photograph people. I don't want to have my camera out on the dance floor. I am going to age around the, the no photo rule a little bit and photograph ambiences 
uh, on my uh, trusty uh, iPhone 12 Pro, which the whole other thing we could talk about is how that makes possible a very different kind of uh, visuality, but where uh, the algorithm and that camera doesn't know what to do with some of these situations because it's it's hunting for figures and things like that and or landscape forms and not finding them. So yeah, there's maybe refuge in the unseen or the almost seen that's uh, of interest to me. Uh, anybody from this scene will recognize where, where this lovely spot is. Uh, I'm interested in um, what I call the rave continuum. Uh, I feel like every good moment uh, at a good rave is connected to every other good moment. And that forms a continuum of moments. I was at some event where we we're all asked, you know, like, what were your like peak, you know, party experiences? And I'm like, I can't separate them because to me, it's all one continuum. There was like this two hours at this one. And then there was another, maybe it was an hour, maybe it was four, you don't even know. So to sort of think of different kind of temporality and to think this is a temporality that's sort of outside uh, of the uh, conventional one and outside of historical time, that's an argument that I'm going to make in a minute as well. And within that rave continuum, I'm interested in the phenomenology of particularly the trans uh, raver's body. I can't speak for all trans people, uh, obviously, but it's certainly my experience and it's a resonant abstraction with other trans people. The dissociation is our wheelhouse, you know, like our bodies are a problem, so we're out of them a lot. Um, but rather than think of dissociation in a clinical way, is there a way that dissociation is an art form that we may have a, a particular talent for? Other people do too, other people dissociate. It's a response to trauma, for example. Uh, but then are there qualities and kinds of dissociation and can you cultivate and train those in the rave continuum in rave a situation? That sort of became the aesthetic project uh, of this particular little uh, book that I'm summarizing here. So I'm interested in the experience of within the rave continuum of what I'm going to call K-time, a kind of dissociative set of times, K for ketamine, which is sort of maybe the dominant uh, chemical assistant uh, in the particular rave scene that I'm connected to. I'm not advocating for drug use, by the way. I'm just simply observing that it's a thing that happens. Uh, so I'm not here to praise it or condemn it. It's just a thing that people do. Uh, so, and I call it K-time because ketamine is a dissociative and in a slightly different sense, are there ways of cultivating dissociative states as aesthetic experiences where the visual complex is marginalized and you're feeling embodiment in relation, not just to sound, but to the physical vibration of the body, this proximity to others, light, fog, and, and you know, in a sense, all of your other senses with vision diminished. So four subsets of this sort of dissociative K time that I've experienced, and maybe there's others, and it would be kind of fun to share versions of this. Uh, let me just see if I can. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, it's a little slow. Uh, rave space would be one of those. Um, and to me, that's that sense of uh, when you can get out of your subjectivity uh, and you're, you might still be thinking and, and, you know, I can't shut down my inner monologue. It just goes at 100 miles an hour. And I have multiple, not multiple voices, but the different versions of sentences are being formed in my head. You can see I became a writer. Uh, so, but I, 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 rave space is, is an experience where my body is moving in relation to the music and, and those thoughts are free and they sort of, they detach from subjectivity and I dissociate from subjectivity. Turns out other trans people and other people with dissociative tendencies can do this too. And it's a tendency that you could cultivate, experience and even enjoy on the dance floor. There's a relief from being constantly trapped in your subjectivity. So that's one, like the second uh, dissociative state that I experience I've called Xeno Euphoria, uh, a term I got from a book by Paul Patine Hartscape, by the way, and Ray Space I got from uh, Jesse Rovinelli to, to name check people I've got ideas from. Xeno Euphoria is that experience of the strangeness of the body, but where, you're, enjoy, where you enjoy it, where uh, it's maybe like uh, um, a dysphoria in reverse uh, of, of a euphoric relation to a body that, that's somehow other. Uh, so yeah, pleasure in the strangeness of embodiment, which for a trans person, I think is hard, but special if you can get into that, that particular state. 
Third one I've called enlustment. <laughs> this probably doesn't need a lot of explanation, but pleasure in the, the erotic charge of the body in relation to others. Um, now, this should happen in a consensual way, and it doesn't always in the space of the rave, to be clear, but where uh, you're relating to others in the space of the dance floor, and it has not necessarily a sexual, but an erotic kind of connection to the movement with others that everyone's agreed in your immediate circle to be part of. Or enlustment could be you fuck somebody at the rave, uh, or it could be the dark room, like uh, particularly for circuit gays, uh, there's some, some parties will have a space that's a completely dark room, go do whatever you want, uh, condoms will be provided. So that's enlustment. And then the fourth state I'm calling side chain time, uh, that sense of the rave continuum is sort of like blasting through gaps in historical time into a sort of, it doesn't negate historical time, but it's sort of outside of it for moments. Uh, side chain in music production is where uh, you know, you have all of these different elements of the track and then for the split second when, for example, the kick drum hits, all the other uh, sounds are minimized and so the kick drum like punches through and sidechain is the way you, you set up the, uh, um, set it up to run where it will create those gaps for that one thing to punch through. So I'm thinking of Brave Continuum as sort of like a punch through historical time uh, that forms a temporality. Uh, you know, a red continuum is like a, a pocket in time where there's more time is the feeling that you can sometimes get uh, at a rave. But it ends. It, it ends. We'll come to that. And that's ongoingness. Like the thing about the rave is that it ends. Uh, the thing about uh, a common experience, I think, of historical time now is the sense of its lack of ongoingness. Uh, concepts of both history and desire tend to hinge on the existence of future times and they, there might not be a lot of future time and how do we process that emotion and how do we live with the possibility that there might not i'm not saying there aren't futures but where there might not be futures or might not be very many good ones anymore now of course one should struggle in the daylight to do something about that but in the nighttime one needs to escape from that feeling or process that feeling so how do we live without ongoingness how do we live in a different temporality? And Ravers, I think, has a certain kind of cultural energy it didn't have in the 90s when I first experienced it. And I think that's one of the things that it connects to. There are other things it connects to, but that's certainly one. So, and here's like late in the party, you can see someone's little like baggie that probably has their drugs in it that they forgot. And then uh, some mate is the famous white label. Uh, the official beverage of like the Brooklyn rave scene, an aluminium bottle of water that somebody enjoyed for a minute when that bottle will last for a hundred years or something. So obviously all of this participates in an impossible temporality of extraction and waste. So it's not free from that. All right, let me get 28 up. Uh, so, you know, the things in, in, uh, Capital. So sort of like the, what I think of as resonant extraction, uh, abstractions that I'm kind of creating out of these experiences. And feminism I got from a meme, you know, it's a meme of a sickle crossed with a Hitachi magic wand, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, okay, so could we rethink uh, a kind of um, horizon of possibility that's not a future anymore, uh, is a present one could have? Uh, and that centers kind of femme experience. And that can be hard, even in queer nightlife is where's uh, femme experiences in that and desires and, and needs rather than desires and wants. But every now and then you might kind of find it where there's a kind of decentering of uh, a kind of cishet patriarchal visual regime in favor of something else. Uh, my, the one thing I observe about gender and the dance floor is that straight men cannot dance uh, because in order to enjoy uh, particularly techno, you have to let the beat fuck you and straight men will not go there. Now, you may have friends who are straight men who actually dance. Uh, and my counter to that proposition is they are not straight when they are dancing because they have let the beat fuck them. <laughs> So that's that's kind of like my my sort of like gender theory of uh, queer rave space, because like you you see like the straight guys show up and they do this like 
and then they stop because <laughs> they can't they can sort of like mime dancing but they can't let it into the body so feminism to me is that experience of uh letting go of uh a certain kind of um rigidity of the body of the body being permeable uh and to me that's a kind of aesthetic experience that i'm going to call feminism for want of a better word obviously this is a highly personalized gender theory that a you know, resonant abstraction you may or may not share so yeah can we dial down the cishet male gaze and the image complex to which it's created? Not entirely. And obviously I'm bending the boundaries of this a little bit by even bothering uh, or even daring to <laughs> take pictures of, of parties. You notice I've been very careful not to uh, have anybody recognizable. There's no pictures here that are actually from the dance floor except that one uh, mistake that I regret uh, where I'm, I'm trying to be very discreet and not interrupt. Uh, the interbody experience that others are happening uh, are having, but yeah, maybe one way to think why this is a kind of cultural experience that has energy at the moment and uh, is uh, popular also in, in unhelpful ways. People ask me and my friends, "And where's the party at?" As if it's a thing that you could come and consume. But I think some of us are a little protective of this space. And that's why I'm not naming where these things happened or who's involved um, beyond some DJs who, who are publicly known and so forth. So there's good news and bad news. <laughs> Maybe there's a way within a, a sort of technological space within this, what if it's not even capitalism or worse, gentrifying urban landscape to create uh, a different aesthetic, aesthetic experience that uh, downplays visuality um, or where visuality is experienced differently as a subordinate sense in relation to others. But there's still what you might call algorithmic visibility. So whatever day this was, I took 16,000 steps between about 5 a.m. and I, I'm guessing that's 7 or 8 a.m. because that's when I got up, went to the rave uh, and then got tired and went home. So what that leads me to speculate is that uh, Google or Apple or whoever has access to this data thrown off by those phones will know where the raves are uh, because this data about steps will geolocate. Uh, it'll be clear that I took all of those steps within 100 feet. I didn't actually walk anywhere. If you were to cross-reference this with the phones in everybody else's pocket, the steps would be at 140 beats per minute or whatever was playing. So like the uh, data signature of where the party was at and even what kind of music was playing at the party is right there because techno is faster than a house, is faster than hip hop. So you could even tell, you know, if, if, you, if someone bothered to come through that data at Google or Apple, whoever gets these, uh, buys this data from them. So maybe there's other kinds of uh, visibility uh, that are a little hard to kind of escape. And this is, you know, before we even get to the person who took video at a, a well-known queer rave in New York City and put it on TikTok and it got 300,000 views and all of the comments are like, where's this? I want to come to it. And it's like, honey, you're just not ready. Here are the starter parties. Please go, go to those first. So uh, the kind of like a digital trace is going to get you in the end anyway. So I'm sorry to end on a slightly pessimistic note, but you know, parties are still great. And I'm sure they are in Sydney and elsewhere as well. I'll shout out also to uh, Fiona Kelly McGregor, uh, who has written really beautiful stuff. Um, her novel, um, Chemical Palace, I particularly recommend in her nonfiction collection, uh, both about the queer party scene in New York in the 90s. So I sort of glancingly experienced, but it was before I transitioned. So I kind of felt uh, like it was a space that wasn't quite for me at the time. But shout out to Fiona if you get to watch this on, on video. And thank you for, uh, uh, for that space and your connection to that space. So um, the first bit of the, uh, the, the book I'm writing about this comes out with Duke uh, next spring, Northern Hemisphere time, fall, sorry, autumn, <laughs> Southern Hemisphere time. A uh, piece of it I set to beats is on uh, Bandcamp uh, to a track called K-Time, uh, which is free if you want to like hear a, a piece of the, the work itself with some beats by uh, ICS um, underneath it. 
And uh, I think I'll leave it. I see already there's a question and things in the chat. And uh, once I quit the screen, I can get back to that. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's what I have. Thank you for coming to my TED talk about the queer racing. <laughs>